All right, we started off here in Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be coming back to it a little bit later as well. But, um, you know, we start off in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter, right? It's very, very sort of very great book of the Bible or chapter of the Bible. And um, we see here, ultimately, what, you know, one of the things we take away from this chapter is that the Christian life, if you want, if you want victories in your life, It's going to come through faith. We were saying that song, you know, faith is the victory, right? Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And we see people, you know, the, the Bible gives this list of people who have done great things for the Lord. All, I mean, all the heroes of the faith that you have listed here, you have Abraham and Moses and David, you know, and, and so many people that are just, just these pillars and these, these heroes are, are found in this chapter, and it's all attributed to their faith. And what I'm going to be preaching on this morning, I actually, um, I wanted to leave Brother Joseph with something, with some encouragement, because he's going to be leaving us and leaving our congregation to go to Korea. He's been there for a while already, but, but things have been happening in his life. Now, just because, you know, this is what prompted my sermon this morning, but this isn't just for him. This is for everybody. There's great biblical truths here, and I want everybody to listen to what, to what I'm going to be preaching this morning, to apply it to yourself. Personally, because this, this is a core doctrine. This is, this is a core teaching that we need to make sure we get down and just let that sink in when you just see all of these people mentioned here all had the faith. And it's not just talking about the faith of salvation. Right? When you read Hebrews 11, obviously we know that, that putting our trust in Jesus Christ is what saves us. It's faith in Him, it's faith in what He did for us, right? That's the, the most basic, fundamental faith that you can have. But what we read about here, what we read about in Hebrews 11, are the people who did something with their faith, the people who actually demonstrated their faith through their works, people who had a lively faith where their faith was not dead. They acted on the things that they truly believed in. Abraham, you know, he was called out from, you know, from his hometown, from his home country by faith. He just listened to God and did what God told him to do. Didn't know where he was going, didn't know the whole plan, didn't need to know it, because he had faith that the Lord is faithful, that God is good, God is true, and if God's telling me to do something, you know, I'm just going to do it because God's not going to lead me astray. He's not going to cause me to fall into some pit. He, you know, he didn't, Abraham didn't have the attitude that the children of Israel had when they were led out of Moses, led out of Egypt by Moses in the wilderness, and were like, oh, you, you took us out of Egypt just to kill us here in the wilderness. They totally lacked faith. They didn't believe in God. They didn't trust in the Lord with their safety, with their, you know, with their future, with everything. And this is the type of faith that we need to have. This is the faith that, that, that God is looking for. And I just want to start off by, by commending you know, some of the things that Brother Joseph said. Well, one of the reasons why I even want to preach is you know, people have come and gone through this church, but um, even though Joseph hasn't been here for that long, He has been very faithful to our church with many of you maybe not even realizing how faithful he's been even from before moving out here to join our congregation. He's been, you know, volunteering to upload, you know, lots of audio sermons and things and, and helping out with, with internet stuff, with the YouTube stuff and, and doing things like that. You know, he's, he's volunteered to upload the videos of YouTube. He shows up. <laughs> it's, 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 it's funny. Today, I have this in my notes, all these different, I was thinking about like all these things where Joseph has been very faithful because that's what we're, what we're talking about here and showing up to church on time. He's, <laughs> he's usually here every other time, of course, except what, you know, when I'm preaching this or showing up to church on time. You know, he's been playing music for us and has added a, another element To the church that's been lacking, you know, at bringing musical ability and, 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 and helping out in that area, and basically just putting forth any extra effort whenever needed. You know, if, if there's ever anything that I need to have done, he's one of the, one of the people, not the only person, one of the people I've been able to count on to say, hey, can you get this done for me? We're, we're lacking in this area, and that, and that is a, a, an attribute of someone who's a faithful person, Someone who's reliable, someone that I can put faith in or you can put faith in that if you ask them to do something, you know they're going to do it. If they say something, then you know that they're going to be a, a man of their word. And these are important attributes to have. He's been faithful to soul winning. He comes up here, he's been driving up from Phoenix every Sunday, going to church in the morning, sticking around for soul winning, going to church in the evening, playing music, you know, before going home. That's faithfulness. 
You know, a lot of people have a hard time, even in their local community, going to church, you know, more than just, just one time, and it's right here. He's an example of someone who's, who's going above and beyond and, and, and putting forth a lot of effort and being faithful. I'm going to read for you some of the key attributes here found in various scriptures. You don't have to turn to all these, but um, one of the key attributes of men in the Bible that were most used by God is that they were faithful. And again, this is going to be the same people we already saw in Hebrews 11. Numbers 12, 7 says, my servant Moses is not so. This is God speaking about Moses. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. And in that passage, if you remember, he was talking about how, you know, with his other prophets, with other people he speaks to in dreams and in visions, and it's kind of like dark and, you know, the, the things that they see. He's like, that's not the way it is with Moses. Moses, I speak to face to face. Moses is, you know, like a friend of God, right? Moses is someone, he says, and, and why is it my, my servant Moses? Not so, why? Who is faithful in all mine house. That's why. Because Moses was faithful. He knew that when he goes to Moses and he tells Moses things, he's going to deliver the message. There's a lot that Moses delivered to the children of Israel. I mean, he delivered the law to them. You talk about things that might not be received so well. Why don't you read through Leviticus? Why don't you read through Deuteronomy? Moses was found faithful to give them everything that they needed to hear. Not holding back, not censoring the message. No, he was found faithful. And that's why God was able to speak with them face to face. Hey, I know my servant Moses. He is faithful in all mine house. And Moses said, in all mine house. Not, not you know, he was faithful to God. Right? It's one thing to be faithful to your own house, and you ought to be. You ought to be faithful in your own house. But then taking that faithfulness and being faithful in God's house as well. You ought to have both. Moses was faithful in God's house. 1 Samuel 2.35, in reference, in the beginning of 1 Samuel 2, remember it's talking about Eli and how Eli raised up children that were children of Belial. They were, they were false prophets. They were, they were these Levites that were, were stealing of the, of the sacrifices and people were, were having contempt for bringing in their sacrifice because of these two wicked men. And Eli brought them up, and Eli has ended up being rebuked by a man of God by saying, you know what? Didn't, didn't I call your fathers out here to be priests and, and to do this service of the Lord, and this is what you're doing with it? And, he said, and, and basically, he receives this curse. Both of his children are going to die in one day, and that uh, you know, other people within his household, right? Like, like within, within his family tree, his, his area, the, they're going to be begging, and they're going to beg to have somebody to put them into a priest's office because, you know, basically God, you, God was saying, you know, they're not going to have length of days and they're just basically going to be cursed because of what he did. But here's what God also said in verse 35 uh, of 1 Samuel 2, and I will raise me up a faithful priest. Why? Because Eli wasn't being faithful. He wasn't faithful raising up his children and he wasn't being faithful in the, even in the house of the Lord. You remember when, when uh, the story where Samuel was hearing from God for like the first time. And he wasn't even saved yet. He was, he was hearing the Lord and he kept on going into Eli saying, well, here I am, here am I. You called me. No, that wasn't me. You know, and, and two times he goes to him, you called me. No, I didn't go back to bed. And then the third, you know, he's like, oh, that must be the Lord calling you, right? And Eli tells him all this. But in that story, in that passage, it talks about the fire going out in the house of the Lord, the flame going out. Well, you know what is the priest's responsibility? It's Eli's responsibility to make sure that that was burning day and night, that that was always going and that that flame didn't go out. He was not faithful in the house of the Lord. And that's why God said, I am going to raise me up a faithful servant. He says, and I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And the blessings that God, and we're going to get to this in a little bit, but God lays so many blessings on those who will just be faithful to him, who will do what he says to do and perform the things according to God's heart, according to God's mind, not according to our own heart, our own feelings, our own thoughts, but what God says. 1 Samuel twenty two fourteen was another, that, that's, and that's referring to Samuel. Samuel was, a, was the priest he raised up. That was faithful to the Lord. That was faithful in all things. That was able to endure persecutions. That was able to just deliver what God said 
without, without censoring. 1 Samuel 22, 14, Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, Who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house? Again, David being referred to as someone who was faithful. And how faithful was David to King Saul? Every opportunity he had to kill Saul, who was after him to kill him, didn't lift up his hand against him. And remain faithful in the Lord. The Lord, Lord's going to be the judge. God's going to take care of this. I'm not going to lift up my hand to the Lord's anointed. That was David's attitude the whole time. He remained faithful to God's word. He remained faithful even as being a servant in the house of Saul. He remained faithful to him. Even when things were going bad for him, even when he endured persecution at the hands of Saul, he remained faithful. And that is a Christ-like attitude to have. Jesus Christ remained faithful to the cause of dying on the cross and paying for our sins even when he was rejected. Even when people mocked him and ridiculed him, he died for the people that were ridiculing him. He remained faithful. And you know what? He still remains faithful once you put your faith in him to still save your soul even though you still sin after you get saved. He still remains faithful and doesn't back off of his promise of eternal life. And David was a good illustration of that type of faithfulness. Now, of course, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was a type of Christ in the Bible. And that, and that attribute of being faithful is, is, is tremendous. Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. Of course, Daniel is extremely faithful as well. The Bible says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. See, when, the, when, when the, the, the enemy, when wicked people want to tear you down, want to stop the work that you're doing, want to, want to get you to quit for serving the Lord, they're going to try to find your weakness. They're going to try to find an area where you're not doing that great in, where, where you maybe can be reproached because you have some sin, because you're doing some wickedness. Daniel was faithful. They couldn't find anything wrong with them. They couldn't find anything wrong with them according to God's law, and they couldn't find anything wrong with them even just according to the government position he was holding. He was faithful. The job that he was doing, he did it to a T. And they, did, they could not find any reason. to and, they, and that's why they had to make up a law that contradicted God's word because they knew that he would be faithful to God's word even over man's law. And we see how much Daniel is exalted in the Bible as well. I mean, it's, um, he's mentioned in Hebrews 11 as well. Galatians 3, 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Of course, Abraham was very faithful. I mentioned him at the, kind of in the beginning of the sermon. And there's so many others. But these are specifically mentioned as being faithful. And these are who we look to as being heroes of the faith. So how important is it to be faithful? If you want to be a success in your Christian life, you need to remain faithful dependable. You need to be safe. If you want to be used of God, because so many people I think here have a heart to say, I want God to use me. I want Jesus to get the most glory and honor as a result of me offering up myself to do his work. Guess what? If you're not faithful, it's not going to happen. And this is a real simple concept to grasp. If you want anything done, like if you need to, if you require the services of anybody to get something done, and I don't care if it's in, in the business world or in your personal life or whatever, anything that you need someone else to do for you, you're going to want the person who's reliable and dependable and who's going to be there on time. And, and who's going to show up and do the work. Not someone who's going to flake out on you. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't make it. That person's not going to get the call. You might get that call one time. You know, if I'm looking at to hire someone to do some work at my house or something, and I call them up, we agree to something, yeah, I'm going to do this, we agree, make agreement, this is going to happen, and then, oh, I'm so, oh, yeah, I can't make it here, and then, no, oh, sorry, I can't make it again. And being totally unreliable, guess what? I'm not going to ask that person for help ever again. I'm never going to hire that person again. I'm not going to use them to, to get work done. Well, God's the same way. He expects us to be faithful. He tells us, and, and it's, the instructions are very clear. They're straightforward. He gives us his word, what he expects of us, what he demands of us, and what the work that he wants us to do. 
And if you want to be used of God in some great work, some great effort, some great project, something that's going to be a big thing done in this world to bring honor unto Jesus Christ, you better show yourself faithful and faithful in all the little things. You're not, no one's going to entrust to you the great riches unless you can show yourself faithful in the little things. You have to be dependable in all areas. God wants you, you want God to look down on you and be like, yep, here's someone who they are there. When, you know, when the doors are open, they're at church. When, when there's something going on, when there's soul winning times, they're going out soul winning. When, 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 whatever the case may be, right? All the different things, all the different areas of work that some of them might just be small areas. But if you're there, you're on time, you're showing up, you're being faithful, God can rely on you and God will see, wow, here's someone who really cares about what I say. Here's somebody who really wants to be used. I'm going to use that person. The most go-getters, the most pe you know, the people who have the most drive, even in the business world, are going to be the ones that are going to be doing the biggest projects and, and, and having the most responsibility and, and, and getting the most things done because they're putting forth the effort and they're showing up on time and they're staying late. And that's the way we need to be in our attitude with God. Say, God, I want you to use me. It's not about me. It's about you. So I'm here. I want to serve. If you have that heart, you need to be found faithful. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 25. Keep a finger in Hebrews 11 because we are going to come back to that. Keep a finger in Hebrews 11. We, we will go back. There's a few verses I want to just point out specifically. Brother can you turn to Aaron, please? I'm dying up here. Faithful men are hard to come by, by the way. When it actually comes to just true faithfulness, people who could be relied on, and it seems to be getting harder and harder and harder as the, as the days continue on. This seems to be something that's lacking in, in just in people's character and the way that they're brought up from, from their youth. Like today's youth seem to be, and, and a lot of that has to come with the destruction of the family and parents not being parents and they're being friends instead of being parents and not holding their children accountable and trying to, to build in them that instinct, the, the character to actually do what you say and say what you do and, 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 and get the job done and be reliable and be someone that you can depend on. These days, there's so, you know, people treat lying as no big deal. People aren't showing fidelity in their relationships and their marriages, right? Can't trust someone anymore nowadays. These, these days, it seems, people don't even want to get married because there's so much divorce. There's, what's the point? I might as well just be a, a boyfriend, girlfriend because you break up then. Why go through all the hassle of dealing with a divorce? It's because they don't have the character that says failure is not an option. They don't have the character to say, I made this vow and I'm going to stick by my word and that's just the way that it's going to be. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm going to read for you from the book of Psalms. Psalm 12, verse 1 reads, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Psalm 31, 23 says, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. God blesses the faithful. They're hard to come by. They fail from the children of men, but God will bless you for being faithful. Psalm 101, 6 says, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall preserve me. God's eyes are upon the faithful land. God's looking for those that are faithful. And he says that they may dwell with me. You want to be close to God? Be faithful to God. Proverbs 28, 20 says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings. A faithful man. He says you're going to abound. with. You want to be blessed of God? Be faithful. Be dependable. Show up to do the work of the Lord. You'll be blessed for that. He says, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You're in Matthew 25. We're going to read this, this, uh, this parable from Jesus. Matthew 25, we're going to start reading in verse number 19 about the blessings that you'll receive then in the afterlife as well for being a faithful servant to the Lord and doing what he has for you to do. See, our blessings, they don't always come in this lifetime in the short term. But the blessings, and this is why you need to have faith. It's faith in the unseen, right? Not being able to see it, but knowing that it's going to come. That's how you should be acting is knowing that that's going to happen. And then you'll be faithful.
full. You'll be full of faith when you're acting on what you don't see that you know is going to be coming to you later, that you know that when you're doing the work of the Lord, He will reward you. Matthew 25, verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So look at, this is how God rewarded. He said, look, I just asked you to be faithful in a few things. I've given you something to work with, and we all have something that God's given us to work with. We all have strengths. We all have, have attributes. We all have talents that God has given to us to use. We all have that. But are you being faithful with what God has given you? He says, look, if you're just faithful in these few things, and let's face it, the things that God really wants us to do and the work that we have to do for God, it's not that much. It's only a few things. It's, it's, it's really not this huge list of all, you know, not breaking God's laws isn't the things he wants you to do. That's not doing some things, right? Keeping, keeping yourself from, from committing fornication or adultery or stealing or lying, you know, you're not doing anything. You're just not doing bad things. So don't use that as your measuring stick. The thing that God has actually called us to do, you know, like preaching the gospel to every creature and, 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 and visiting the fatherless and widows and their affliction and doing these types of things, it's not a very long list. It's not like there's so many different things to do. He just wants you doing a lot of the few things. As much as you can do. And whatever he's given you, he expects you to use. And he, he says here, if you, if you could be faithful and relied on to use what I've given you in just a few, uh, just a, a, the little bit I've given you, be faithful in that little bit, I'll, I'll bless you with much. That's why he says, you know, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. God's abundant blessing coming forth. I mean, and, and really just consider, just take a step back from your life and just consider how much of a burden is it really? Think about day-to-day -day life. Is it really that big of a burden to set some time apart to make sure you know God's word? to be in prayer to God and, and most importantly, to make sure you're doing like work for him. When you pray to God, you're not doing work for God. You're staying in communication with God, which is good. You'd be relying on God to help you out in, in, in all your need. And, and, you know, maybe in prayer for other people can be seen as somewhat of a, of a, of a little bit of a work, right? And we ought to be faithful in that. Praying for other people, but it's, and it's really not that much work. But are you even taking the time apart to do that? Reading from God's word, that's not, I don't, I don't find that to be, you know, being faithful in some great work of putting forth this effort, but letting, ministering to other people, you know what, that is a work. Helping people out, like I said, visiting the fatherless and the widows and their affliction, uh, preaching the gospel, whatever, that is a work. If we could be faithful to do those things, is it really that big of a deal to set aside a little bit of time during the week? Or is it more important to do everything else in your life? Because let me tell you what, everything else in your life when you get to heaven, God's not going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. He's not going to say that because you've kept your house clean, because you've, you know, accumulated wealth and, and were able to buy things and whatever, you know. God is not going to give you the rewards for that. That is not of eternal value. All the things that you do here, how great your house is and your vehicles and everything else, whatever it is you accumulate, it's all going to burn up. It's going to be gone. And that's not what you want to have built up for yourself when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ because gone. Here today, gone tomorrow. We need the things that last. And, and the talents that God has given us, we use those. We do the work. We can be faithful in, that, in those areas. God will bless us. So let's keep reading here. Verse 22. He also had received two talents, came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, 
I have gained two other talents besides him. Look at this. One person was given more, and he gained more. He did, you know, he, he had more to produce. He had five versus the two. But look at what his answer is. Verse 23, his Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of now. Did, it, did he say, well, good job, but you didn't do the five? He says, no. You gave him two? You got two? Well done. You gave me five? You got five? Well done. He's given you one? You got one? Well done. He's giving you, you know, what, whatever it is, whatever God has given you, he just wants you to use it. You don't have to worry about comparing yourself to anyone else. Just worry about being faithful to God and to his word and the work that he has for you to do. We don't have to get caught up in what anyone else is doing. And even as a church, we don't have to get caught up in what other churches are doing, what everyone else is doing. Look, we have a work to do here. You know, people might come to other church and say, oh man, you know, I've been to these other churches and you guys, you guys have only had like 100 people saved this year. It doesn't matter. We're doing the work with what we have, with what God has given us here to do, and we're going to be faithful in the work that we do. And if we're doing the best with what God has given us, then God is going to look at that, and whether anyone else goes to heaven, he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, for the great things that they've done. Amen and amen. I'm happy for it, and it's exciting. But you know what? He's going to do the same thing here. For people who have been faithful giving their time, going out and doing the work of the Lord. And if you don't receive as much because maybe we haven't been given as much here, he's still going to say the same thing. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So you don't have to worry about comparing yourselves among, and even among each other, just individuals. Oh, this person uh, you know, always gets this many people. You know. Do the work that God has for you to do. But also don't sell yourself short either. Don't, don't, don't automatically think, well, God hasn't given me anything, right? Or God's only given me one talent. Look, you shouldn't be thinking, you know, and the reason why people have that mentality, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I don't want you to think that, like, well, God hasn't given me that much, so I'm just okay with maybe getting one person saved a year or maybe, you know, just eventually just, just doing some little amount of work, right? We don't need to be as worried about just the, you know, the outcome as much as we are about our time of being faithful to the Lord. Put in the time. Put in the effort. If you're given all that you have, and I don't know if anybody, any of us is, giving all that we have, then you have no reason to, to worry about, you know, like, you know, God, God, God will bless, God will give the outcome. But then we can be found using what God has given us when we give all that we have. When we dedicate ourselves and, and, and show ourselves to be faithful to serving the Lord. Don't, don't cut yourself short and say, well, that's it. That's all I have. Because honestly I, 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 honestly, I don't think that anybody here is giving all that they have. I know I'm not. And I try to hold myself to a high standard and do what I can. But I still think, I know there's areas where I'm failing. I'm not doing as much as I think I could. And the truth could be said, you know, because uh, I'm not perfect. I still have a flesh. I still, I still get tired. I still get weary. Of, you know, I still get in a bad attitude. I try not to be, but, you know, it, and it does happen. But we need to make sure that we don't get turned around and let that attitude bring us down and stop working. We need to, we need to keep working. So let's see here. We're going to keep reading this, this, uh, this parable in Matthew 25. So the man that had five earned five. Well done, good and faithful servant. The man that was given two. Earn two. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Look at verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is... I, <laughs> This is not talking about someone losing their salvation. I don't want to say that right off the bat. But 
the concept of not doing anything for the Lord and not receiving of it and just saying, you know what, the things that you thought you had, they're taken away from you, still stands. You know, this is just, just, just in your work, right? Um, obviously, there, there's, there's more to this story, and I really don't want to get into everything when it comes to the unprofitable servant being cast into outer darkness because that's someone who's not saved and they're going to hell. God gave him the ability, gave him opportunity, and he didn't do it. But we need to be um, not only a child of God, but also a servant. We need to be doing the work. We need to be putting forth our efforts into getting other people saved so that we can be profitable in the eyes of the Lord. Now, there are lots of opportunities for God to use you as long as you have the willingness and you can remain faithful. You can be reliable by God. There are a tremendous amount of opportunities and we should all be preparing ourselves to be used of God. That's, that's the work that's going to be required on our end is that no matter what situation you may find yourself in, you ought to be ready. And this does require hard work and it does require effort. There's been times, you know, especially when I was still growing and learning and learning soul winning, that um, there were opportunities that had presented themselves to me. And even before, even before I got in church, after I was saved, I had this great opportunity with, with someone that I worked with a long time ago, back when I was just living, a, I was saved, I was living a worldly life, I was working at a pool hall and, you know, whatever. And, and I had this opportunity where, a friend of mine had gotten in this, a really serious accident and almost died and his head was split open and, you know, and all these you know, crazy, you know, evacuated a helicopter and, and, and he survived and he didn't have brain damage. And it's, it's, it's a miracle that he was even still alive. And then after this whole thing, which, you know, if that happened to you and you're not saved, I mean, that's going to get you thinking pretty heavily and pretty seriously, right? So there's this opportunity I had in this guy's life to be able to share the gospel with him as he's bringing up, you know, Mormonism and other things, because now he's searching, now he's seeking, now he wants to know, like, I need to get right with God. I need to find God and, and get right with him after this situation. You know, he had a family and everything else, and I totally blew it. Totally blew it. Why? Because I wasn't prepared. Because I wasn't ready. Because I was living a hypocritical lifestyle. Because I, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even bring myself to even say much of anything because of the way that I was living was demonstrating, well, how could you say you believe in the Bible when you're doing this and this? Like, I know you, right? That's the way I was, and, 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 and I was ashamed. And because I wasn't ready, because I wasn't prepared, because I wasn't keeping myself unspotted from the world, I blew it. And now that guy, I mean, I hope that guy gets saved. I don't know, I haven't done him in a super long time. I don't even know, you know, I don't even know where he is or anything, but... We're gonna, you're going to find yourself in situations like that. And you need to make sure that you're ready. You know, we heard about the stories last week when we had Brother Joseph preaching for us and, and, he, and he shared with us all the, 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 the great things that were happening in, in South Korea and the people that, that, they, that they were brought into contact with and, and all these opportunities and, and kind of, you know, you, you might, some of you want to call them random or coincidences. That there's no way they were coincidences. That the way that God worked out each individual in these various stories to just, just happen to cross, cross paths with Joseph and Angelica and get them saved. But thank God, see, they were faithful. They prepared themselves. They have the scriptures memorized. So even if the Bible wasn't handy to them, they're able to, to quote the, the word of God and they're ready and on the lookout for people to give the gospel to. It's one thing just to have the scriptures memorized, but it's another thing to be having the attitude and the, and the, the thoughts in your mind at all times. Hey, I need to give this person the gospel. Because that's another time we miss opportunities is when you have time alone with someone, everything's going great, and it never even crosses your mind to give them the gospel when you so easily could. Don't blow those opportunities either. Because I'll tell you what, when God's looking for the faithful witness to give people the gospel, to get people saved, if you really want to be used of God and, and many attributes, you know, don't blow those, those, those opportunities. Train yourself and get yourself be thinking on more gospel-minded. And you know what? One way to do that is show up to all the soul winning times. The more you're actually committed to doing something, the more it's going to be in your mind. If you never show up to soul winning times, you know what? You're a lot more likely to not even be thinking about giving acquaintances or strangers or anyone the gospel because 
you've already decided it's not that important to you. But when you decide it's important, when you commit yourself into doing the work, into learning, into growing, into doing more, then it's going to be something you're thinking about a lot more frequently, and then it'll be a lot less likely to miss out on those opportunities by remaining faithful to the Lord. Turn back, if you would, to Hebrews 11. I told you to keep a place there, Hebrews 11. And Brother Joseph, I know you came in late, but this sermon's for you. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Glad you didn't miss anything. See, he's remaining faithful by listening to the sermon while he's on the way here, so that's good. All right. <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse number 8, the Bible talks about Abraham here. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And, and what this is relaying here is the fact that Abraham left the comfort of his home. You know, when he was at home, I'm sure he wasn't just living in a tent. His family was established. He had a nice place to live. But when God called him out, he left. And it says here, that's why it makes a point to saying he, he was dwelling in tabernacles. That's what a tabernacle is. It's just a tent. He was living out of a tent. It's like he was camping. Him, Isaac, Jacob, they're all in these tabernacles because they were kind of moving around as God just told them to go. They weren't invested in, 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 in their house. And in the things of this world, when God told them to move, they just did it. And the reason why, as it says here in verse number 10, is because he looked for a city, right? A big city, a building, a foundation, which hath foundations whose builder maker is God. He wasn't looking for the city that, oh, you know, Prescott Valley, Arizona is the best, which it is, I think, the best city in the United States. But he wasn't looking for that physical place like, wow, the mountains and the water and all this other stuff, that didn't matter to him. He would go anywhere that God sent him. He would go to that, you know, fiery oven of Phoenix <laughs> if he needed to go there. He would go up to the freezer in Alaska or, where, you know, wherever it meant. It didn't matter. He's going to go. He's going to stay in a tent. Why? Because the city he was, he was focused on is the heavenly city. It's a city whose builder and foundation is, is God. So he's like, that's what I care about. That's where I want to have my mansion. That's where I want to have my rewards. That's where I really want to build up and invest in is in that home. Because that matters so much more than anything here. And this is why Abraham is, I mean, he's like the father of faith, quote unquote. You know, I mean, he's, he's known as being faithful because he did so much just through faith not knowing anything in advance. God didn't tell him what was going to happen all, every step along the way. He just knew as much as he needed to know and walked and did everything by faith. You need to be able to maintain faithfulness to God and to church, assembling yourselves with like-minded believers no matter where you are. That's something that needs to remain faithful. And I'll tell you what, it's going to be easier to find excuses to not serve the Lord in a foreign country, in somewhere where you're not used to. You're not, you know, when you're established, when you're at home, when you've got a good church, you got everything established, it's pretty easy to get, to get I mean, and, and that's a good thing, right? To get established, to get a good church, to get rooted down in the church. But if God calls you away, like he called Abraham away, he's got another plan for you, another work for you to do, you need to maintain that faithfulness in that journey, in that mission trip. And that's why we have, as we have today, so many missionaries that aren't doing the work. Why? Because it's easy. It's easy to make up an excuse. It's easy to say, well, you don't understand the people. Things are just so different here. We just can't reach the people. It's just hard. All we have to, we just have to build a friendship and just work at it for years and years and years. And then maybe we'll get that person saved. And then make up excuses because maybe they face a little bit of opposition or some hard times at first, and then they just give up. 
And then they show themselves not to just be truly faithful in doing the work of the Lord. But if you are truly faithful, God will bless you. Now, it doesn't matter where you're at. You need to maintain that faithfulness and continue doing the work. And don't get distracted by being in a different area and wanting to do all these other things. Don't be distracted with the things of the world. Don't be distracted with anything else or discouraged because, of, because it's not the same as what you're used to. Wherever you're at, the, the instructions don't change. Reaching people with the gospel of Christ doesn't change no matter where you're at. It's the same instructions for everybody. Anywhere under the globe, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Now, the second point, the second main point, besides being faithful to the Lord, being faithful to his work that he has for you to do, that's the most important, that's the primary, but you need to maintain faithfulness also in your marriage. And this is going to be equally important. And again, Brother Joseph's leaving us. He's going to get married. He's going to be marrying Angelica. Um, is it later this month? November. November. Okay, November. So one month, about one month from today. He's going to be getting married. But look, and, and what I'm going to be teaching, this goes for everybody. It's not just for him, but, but there's this level of faithfulness that we need to have. And um, as you get, when you, when you go from being single to being married, you're going to have a lot more obligations to fulfill to your spouse. That's what happens. You know, the Apostle Paul was talking about this. You know, when, when you get married, you care for the things of this world and, and pleasing your wife or pleasing your husband. They're, they're, this is part of marriage. And it's not, necessarily, it's not a bad thing, but it does change. But see, again, maintain that focus of keeping your faithfulness to God first and foremost. And don't let everything else in the marriage just suck you out of doing work for the Lord. You do need to be faithful to your spouse. You do need to spend time with them. It's going to change how you, you plan your days and your time and stuff. But don't let it change to where God gets removed and replaced with, with everything else going on. It's a, it's, a, it's a pitfall you need to watch out for. You need to be a faithful husband or a faithful wife. Your priorities are going to change as you get a wife or a husband and hopefully you know, have children as your family begins to grow. Priorities change. You think about other people. I mean, when you're single, what's your priority? You're serving the Lord. When you get married, well, now all of a sudden, it's not just serving the Lord, which that's still first. That, that doesn't ever change. But now you have a wife or a husband to take care of, right? To, to, to fill in your role. There's obligation there. When you get married, you're, you have an obligation to your spouse, one way or the other. If you're a husband, you have an obligation to provide for your family. You have an obligation to provide for your spouse. And we'll get into a few more of the details of God, what God tells us we need to do as husbands. And if you're married as a wife, you have an obligation to serve your husband, to be obedient to your husband and to do things and to be a, a keeper at home and, and to do the things that the Bible lays out for you to do. It's an added obligation that you didn't have before. God's still number one, but then, and then when you have children, guess what? Now there's further obligations. We got to raise these children. We got we to spend and invest time there as well. So your time gets, well, will change with different priorities. But you have to keep the service of the Lord primary. Number one, that's still the most important. And you need to be able to deal with these and manage your time well to make sure everything is getting done. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. Normally when I preach uh, on you know, faithfulness within marriage and stuff. We look at Ephesians 5 or Colossians 3 and, and these are great verses and, and, and go and if you don't know them already, read them later after service, tie this in. But 1 Peter chapter number 3, there's a few, thing, few points I want to make here. And we're going to start off talking about the obligations of a wife according to the Lord, according to Scripture. And the obligations that a wife has to be faithful in her marriage. Verse number 1 of 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible reads, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, very first verse here in, in chapter 3 it says, be in subjection to your own husbands. That's meaning being subject. You're, you're, you're lowering yourself 
in the authority structure and saying, I'm going to, what, what my husband says is what I'm going to do. I'm being subject to him. But I want to point out a very important word in verse number one. See, we have these, these chapters and verses, and I love that they're in the Bible, that delineate, you know, we could, we could refer to passages and refer to specific verses. But verse one starts off with likewise. That's relating something from chapter two. So we can't just rely totally on, on chapter 3 to get our understanding. Let's go back to chapter, the end of chapter 2. What is, he, what is he likening wives being subject to their husbands as? Look, look at verse number 19 in chapter 2. The Bible says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. So just prior to that, it says, Hey, if you're suffering for things that you've done wrong, you know what I mean? If you're... If, if you're if bad things happen to you because you've done a lot of bad things, you ought to take that patiently. And I mean, basically, you're getting what you deserve anyways. But then he says, but if you suffer wrongfully, you know, there's things that you didn't, you're doing everything right, but then you're still just suffering and, and, and you're having bad things happen to you. He says, take that patiently. Because normally our response is going to be, oh, well, I mean, I don't deserve any of this. And you get angry and you get irritated and you want to try to right the wrong and say, oh, I'm right. You want to make sure everyone knows that you're right and, and you try to remedy your own situation as opposed to just taking it patiently. Right? That's what the Bible said. Things are, you know, someone sues you at the law, you know, go here, take my money, right? Someone, someone takes your coat, here, have my cloak also, right? That's what the Bible said. When people defraud you and people are just, just wrongfully doing things against you, he says, just allow, just suffer it and take it patiently. Don't get all upset and worried about it. Because God will take care of it. But this is where we're at now. The context of 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 19. Again, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief. So he's doing what's right. Conscience toward God. Making a biblical stand. Suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So he did everything right. He did no sin. He, wasn't, he didn't have guile found in his mouth. But how did he behave? How did he act? Verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. He didn't stoop down to the level of those who were attacking him. He didn't go and just start reviling them because they were reviling him. And even though he righteously could have, because he was perfect, because he didn't need any rebuke, because he was right, he could have done that. But he's, but he's setting forth an example of saying, no, that's not the way that Christ behaves. And that's not the way that we should behave either. He says, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He's saying, no, I'll let God judge. I don't have to right these wrongs. I know I'm doing what's right. And I know that God sees everything. And I'm going to be faithful to the Lord's judgment. And I'll allow this stuff to happen because God sees what's happening. Look at verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but, now, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And that ends chapter 2 and then chapter 3. Likewise, ye wives. So what? likewise, being in subjection to your own husbands. Guess what? Your husband is the authority, but your husband may do things and you may suffer wrongfully sometimes at the judgment of your husband. Your husband's not perfect. He's not always going to be right in the things that he may tell you to do or have you do. But as long as he's not telling you to contradict God's, God's law or God's word, you may just have to suffer wrongfully. You may just have to endure that patiently and in subjection the way that Christ suffered wrongfully had things said about him didn't revile right this is for wives to be faithful this is the teaching he's likening that to how you know you may suffer wrongfully but it's still your role to be in subjection even if you're being wrong the same way that it was for Christ I'm just going to let God judge 
They're doing wrong to me. I'm doing everything right, but I'm going to be subject to God as the Son was when He was on this earth, being subject to God the Father and allowing Himself to suffer and be persecuted and, and to martyr Himself in letting God be the judge. This is the attitude that, that is being brought forward in, in 1 Peter chapter 3 for the wives to be in subjection. It's, it's light in the same manner, likewise, the same way that it's a blessing for you to suffer wrong, if you suffer wrongfully, to take it patiently. For wives to do the same thing. And look, I'm not saying it's easy, right? It's not easy to suffer wrongfully. You have a righteous indignation sometimes that you don't want, you know, when you know you've done everything right, to be suffering wrongfully, but this is what the Bible is telling us to do. This is what God's word says. Take it patiently. Let's keep reading here in 1 Peter chapter 3. And notice in verse number 1, likewise, you have to be in subjection to your own husbands. And, and why? Why? Why is that so important? That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Because your actions and how you carry yourself speak very loudly and have an impact on people. Christ's actions spoke volumes. He could have just defended himself, right? And would have been right to do so. But by allowing himself to be martyred, what did that, that demonstrated even more the wickedness of those who were condemning him and demonstrated the love that he had even more and demonstrated his faithfulness even more. So that when he died on the cross, you know, the soldiers would say, truly this was the Son of Man or the Son of God. His actions showed that and spake a lot louder than his words. He didn't have to answer Pilate anything. He didn't have to answer anybody. He just took it and went with it. And when the wife can be a, a godly wife and just be in subjection, you know what? God sees that. And you know what other people will see too? This is an example of a godly woman. This is, this is how a godly woman should behave. And we get into that here in 1 Peter chapter 3 with, um, with Sarah. Do you think Abraham was always right 100% of the time in everything that he said or did? No. Because Abraham wasn't Jesus Christ. But you know what it sounds like? It sounds like Sarah obeyed him and everything because she's being used as the example. Look at verse number 2 in 1 Peter 3. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Again, these are female attributes for the wife to have that, that God considers to be very valuable. Verse number 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God, there's that faithfulness of trusting in God, adorned themselves being in subjection under their own husbands. It brings that up again. They adorned themselves with this meek and quiet spirit being in subjection to their own husbands. Look, I didn't write the Bible, but it says what it says. And this is the emphasis that's being brought up multiple times of being in subjection. Why? Because the natural man or the natural woman is not going to want to be in subjection. So it needs to be brought up multiple times. That's why it's brought up in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 and 1 Peter chapter 3. And you see these things over and over again, specifically talking about husbands and wives. Because it deals with what I believe to be kind of the, the, the hardest things for each one to deal with. And some of the most important. To have a successful marriage. Wives look on these verses and husbands look on these verses as well because we're going to get to that in just a second. Verse number 7, or excuse me, verse number 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Knowledge. Hey, husbands, you better know the word of God. If you're going to dwell with your wife according to knowledge, you better know the word of God. You better have that knowledge. That is incumbent upon you. That is a responsibility and obligation that you have to know the word of God and you have to have that knowledge. Why? Because you are the one making decisions. You are the one that's in the authority and your wife is being subject to you so you better know what you're doing and lead your family right. You've got that responsibility and wives, you can at least take comfort in the fact that you don't have that responsibility. 
it, it, it's a hard enough to just stay in subjection, but at least you can take comfort saying, you know what? It's on him because it is. It's on your husband. There's certain areas that God wants you to do, you know, ladies with your children and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, if your family's being led astray, that's not your fault. It's your husband's fault. According to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. A wife that's submissive helps establish her husband because she's going to be helping him by allowing him to lead the family, which is his role and what he's, his responsibility is. And it helps to strengthen the husband and the unity of that marriage when, when the wife is in her proper role in doing that. Now, the husband needs to realize, one, he needs to take authority and take the responsibility and take the headship of the family and not delegate everything to the wife as, as just basically putting her in charge because that's not the job that God gave to her. It's to you. You, do the, you, know, you provide for the family. You go out and do the work. You lead the family and don't just let your wife make all the decisions. You do it. Take it upon yourself. Yeah, it's a little bit of work. Do it. That's what God told you to do. Don't add anything more to your wife. She has a lot to do already. God's given her plenty to do. You don't need to be adding on top of that and, and having her make all your decisions for you. And the husband needs to realize that the wife is a weaker vessel also. It needs to be the strength and the rock in that relationship. As a husband, you can't be losing it and not having the this, this, this stability within your marriage and within your family God designed men and women different. Let's face it. It's a fact. Men and women are not the same. And men are supposed to be strong. They're supposed to be solid. And that's one of the reasons why you're the leader. So when the hard times come, when the storms come, you know, the wife is the weaker vessel. The wife may be a little bit more upset or, or flipped out when things happen. But you know what, men? It's your responsibility to be grounded to be founded, to have the knowledge, and to stay strong so that way you could also be an encouragement to her and help her get through these times, the difficult times. You need to be that rock. And obviously, the rock is Jesus Christ, and that's who we need to have get, gain all of our strength from. But within a marriage, the husband is, is portraying that role of Jesus Christ, as Jesus Christ does to the church, which Ephesians 5 teaches, is, is, is the, the position that we're in with our wives, the husbands with their wives. Being that husband, being that rock, being that foundation for your wife. You need to be faithful in your marriage, not just in keeping yourself only to each other physically, which obviously is extremely important, you know, committing adultery and, and keeping your, your marriage holy in that regard and being faithful in that regard, which again, these days, infidelity is just, is just is, is horribly out of control. Even within Christian circles, right? I mean, people who call themselves, that say that they believe the Bible is still just, it's, it's incredible the amount of infidelity. You have to maintain that faithfulness and keep your vow and keep yourself holy to her, but it's not just in that regard. You need to be faithful in everything. You should be a spouse that can be relied on in everything. The same way if, you, you, if God could rely on you to do work, husbands, your wife ought to be able to rely on you to provide. Your wife ought to be able to rely on you in every area of their life. That he, and, and you know what, ladies? Your husband ought to be able to rely on you as well. They're not flaking out on things and that, and that you're, they ought to be able to you know, speak to you and, and um, rely on you and everything. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven thirteen, a talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. And I'll just leave you, I'll, I'll finish on this last point and again, this, this goes especially for, for newlyweds, people who get newly married. Don't fall into this trap of um, wanting to talk about all of the problems that you have in your marriage right off the bat because everybody has marriage problems right off the bat. Every, don't feel bad about it. Okay, I mean, it's not, it's not fun or pleasant. Everybody goes through a time of having problems in their marriage and especially right in the beginning because you're, you know, you're not used to living together, hopefully, right? That, that's the way, that, that the way God designed it is that you know, it's, it, you're living with someone you weren't living with before. You're going to see all the things that maybe you didn't see before, right? All the, all the quirks, 
all the, the, the problems, right? All the inadequacies, all the failings as a person that they have, as you get to know your spouse, I mean, really well, you're going to realize that they may be the perfect person for you, but they're not perfect. And you're going to see that and it's going to be evident. And there's going to be times where you're arguing and fighting and whatever. I mean, look, that stuff happens. But you, what you don't want to do is to fall into the trap of like going back to mom and dad or going to some other relative or going to someone and just telling them all the problems you're having with your spouse. And this is especially with, with younger people, but not just younger. I mean, don't do that. It's going to come back and bite you. It will. And, and everyone may be well-intentioned, but when you get married to someone, you are now your own team. You are there for each other. You vowed there. You need to be remain faithful first and foremost to each other. You may be fighting. You may be going through problems. You may be going through serious problems, but you need to maintain the mentality that we're on the same team here. And when you start bad-mouthing your husband or your wife to other people, you know what you're doing? You're bringing a bad name on them. You're going to make your family now think less of your spouse, which do you think that's going to solve any of your problems? By having now a cheering section saying, oh, yeah, drop that guy or drop that girl or, or you know, having them now talking bad to your husband or talking bad to your wife when you're around them and not respecting them. Do you think that's going to help your marriage problems? It's not. It's going to only do more harm. And this happens all the time. Don't fall into that trap. Just understand that you can get through this. Everybody has problems. Don't be a tail bearer. Don't be revealing all the secrets that are going on, you know, just between the two of you and you're having problems and fights or whatever. The, no one else needs to know, oh, my husband was a jerk to me today because he said whatever. Or he's telling me I can't do this. Or can't, you know, and just complaining and murmuring and just, and just revealing everything unto, unto other people. It's none, of, it's none of their business. I'm not talking about some extreme situation of like, you know, bizarre child molestation. Obviously, that's, that's a problem that needs to be handled. Right? I'm talking about normal marriages. I'm talking about normal problems. Everybody has those. Have a faithful spirit and just conceal the matter. La leave that between the two of you. You're on the same team. Don't, don't start pitting families against each other. I mean, that, that happens and families then become divided and, and it makes a big mess. And I know you may want to just start spilling the beans to everybody because that's human nature, and especially ladies have a, even more of a problem with this than men. But even men have this problem too of just saying more things than they ought to say. Keep your family, you know, your, your stuff private between the two of you and work through it. Just have, be faithful to each other in that regard. Have the respect for your husband or your wife to just stay faithful to them and say, you know what, I'm not going to be revealing secrets. I'm just going to, we're going to keep this to ourselves and we're going to get through it. Maintain your faithfulness to the Lord. Maintain your faithfulness in your marriage. And if you could do that, you're good. <laughs> you're you're, you're going to be blessed. And, uh, and, and everything will work itself out. Keep, keep our eyes focused on that, that heavenly city whose builder and foundation is God. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the, the clear teachings and the instructions that you give us in your word. God, um, they're not that difficult. We, we know there's not that many things. Just help us to be, to be strong and to, to mortify the deeds of the flesh and, to, and help us to walk in the spirit. Help us to, to be the proper husbands and wives that we need to be within our marriage, God, that you can bless us, that you can bless our marriage, that we can live by example. And, and not just by words, dear Lord. Help us not to ever miss any opportunities to serve you. Help us to, to be in your word. Help us to be studying and training and doing everything we possibly can to be used by you. Help us to be faithful in that which is least, that you could entrust to us the great riches, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.